To a Navy pilot, his first landing on a carrier is a challenge. And when the challenge is successfully met, there's a real feeling of accomplishment. And this feeling persists even after several hundred landings. Obviously, carrier operations do impose various different responses and requirements than land-based operations. But these conditions also offer certain advantages. The ship is moving away from the pilot as he approaches, and his closure rate on the ship is some 30 knots less than ashore. So he has more time to make corrections in his approach. His glide slope is shallower. There is seldom a crosswind. When he touches down, he is not concerned with stopping his aircraft. The arresting gear does the job. And if problems develop, the crash crew is standing by. As his experience increases, the pilot begins to feel that trapping aboard a carrier is preferable in many ways to landing ashore. Still, even with this confidence, backed by growing experience and accumulated skill, accidents do happen. The result is a tremendous waste of human life and material resources. More than half of all Navy aircraft accidents occur during shipboard operations. In many cases, the fault lies with the pilot. These accidents can be prevented by naval aviators who understand what causes mishaps and the actions required to avoid them. All accidents, except those involving material failures, can be prevented or the consequences minimized. In this film, we've included accidents recorded on carrier flat systems. The film quality is not outstanding, but the action illustrates the necessity for constant alertness on the part of a naval aviator in all phases of carrier operations. First, let's see what can happen at the catapult. Make sure you use the catapult's grip and friction lock. The friction lock holds the throttle at full power, so your throttle hand is free to retract the landing gear after you're airborne. Some pilots fail to maintain the proper attitude off the bow. Consequently, they settle below flight deck level, sometimes into the water. In the case of an early breaking holdback or bridle or launch bar failure, cut power to idle and try to stop the aircraft with brakes. If you can't stop, eject. Get out before going over the edge while the plane is in the best attitude for ejection. On a soft cat shot, if your end speed is below minimum for your weight and configuration, eject while you can still hold the nose up. Realize that in these days of highly reliable catapults, most soft shots are pilot caused by accepting an improper weight on the weight board. Know your minimum airspeed and set your bugs. Sometimes you may be able to jettison your external load to reduce weight and drag to maintain flight. If you're out of the envelope of your seat, jettison the canopy so it won't be damaged and fail to open underwater. Blowing a tire on the catapult is generally no problem on launch. Have the landing gear inspected by another aircraft or the tower. In extremes, for example, no rubber left on the wheel, you may have to make a barricade arrestment. If your engine should fail during launch, eject immediately. Again, attitude and rate of descent are the governing factors in the decision to eject or ditch. There is always a possibility that the aircraft control systems can malfunction during a cat shot. If this happens, try to regain control, but realize you have very little altitude and airspeed to work with. Rudder, aileron, or nose trim may be your only means of control. Ejection may be the more prudent decision. The arresting gear, like all mechanical devices, has also been known to fail. If the arresting cable breaks or the arresting engine fails during rollout, you may be faced with an ejection situation. 
If this happens to you, you'll notice that you're essentially taxiing at a high speed toward the end of the angle. Before reaching the end of the flight deck, eject. Generally, if you feel any deceleration, the gear has already slowed you below flying speed. Accidents can also occur in taxiing. On the deck, close teamwork is vital between the pilot and the director. The pilot must react immediately to the director's signals. If you're not responsive to the director, if you taxi too fast, if you're using too much power, if you miss a turn, the result can be a crunch or an aircraft over the side. You can get similar results from aircraft mechanical failure. You might lose your brakes coming out of the arresting gear. The space on a ship is limited. It doesn't leave much room for maneuvering even with brakes. So drop your hook. Use your emergency brake if you have one, or use nose wheel steering to deck loop. Signal for chocks under your wheels. Report on UHF. 524 in the gear, I lost my brakes. Get some chocks into that aircraft in the gear. If you can't get it stopped, eject while you're in the envelope of the seat. If the characteristics of the seat prevent ejection, jettison canopy before you enter the water. Most brake failures are diagnosed by alert pilots when they pump them after lowering the landing gear. However, the impact of landing may render the brakes ineffective. So before you come out of the gear and come on with too much power, make sure your brakes are functioning. Check them on the roll back then ride the brakes a little before gaining momentum. If you lose your brakes at night, turn on lights and drop your hook. Always make a transmission. 524 in the gear, I've lost my brakes. Sometimes a pilot coming out of the gear will taxi too fast in his desire to get across the foul line. In his attempt to slow the speed, his brakes might lock or he hits oil on the deck and parks his bird in the catwalk or uses another aircraft for an expensive chart. There are fixed procedures for operating on the flight deck, but sometimes situations may arise that require just plain common sense. For example, don't let the deck crew remove the tie downs if you anticipate getting a severe blast from planes taxiing ahead of you especially if they are larger planes. Aircraft have been blasted over the side. However, if the situation arises where it is obvious that your plane is going over the side, eject while you are still in the envelope. Think about situations where you're required to make an ejection decision. Stick with your decision. Go. Another situation which can face you while taxiing occurs when the ship is turning, particularly prior to launch. As the ship turns into the wind, use brakes and power to hold the aircraft in position. Strangely enough, most accidents occur when the pilot has the most control during approach and landing. During your approach to a carrier landing, there are three variables meatball, line-up, and airspeed. On the downwind leg, trim your aircraft for optimum angle of attack prior to reaching the abeam position. The standard turn for your type of aircraft will bring you into position for the final approach. If your turn is too tight, you will have an angling approach. If your turn is too shallow, you will have an overshooting approach. You should complete your turn on speed, lined up, and at the proper altitude to intercept the meatball. Extending aft from the port side of the ship, the glide slope beam is computer stabilized to correct for pitch and roll of the ship. The start is when you roll your wings level on the glide slope. The first one third of the approach is referred to as the middle. The second one third is in the groove. In close is five to 10 seconds out. Anything closer is at the ramp. Now let's see and discuss some glide slope corrections. If your approach is high, reduce power to increase rate of descent. 
As the meatball approaches the center, add sufficient power to reduce rate of descent to optimum. Large power reductions require corresponding large power additions to halt aircraft momentum. So a third intermediate power setting is usually required to maintain optimum glide slope. A high and fast condition must be corrected early in the approach. A large power reduction is necessary. Increase the attitude of the aircraft to decrease airspeed to optimum angle of attack. It is necessary to correct the airspeed first to achieve proper hook to eye value, so the pilot is obtaining accurate glide slope information. Maintain optimum angle of attack and proceed as in correcting a high. The possible consequences of the very large power reduction necessary to correct for this condition are decelerating to a slow or developing a large rate of sink, which is difficult to control and may result in a settle below the glide slope. Accidents can occur when an aviator fails to correct for the high or high and fast early in the approach. He either remains high all the way with a greater sink rate at touchdown and a possible bolter, or he settles below the glide slope in close to at the ramp and winds up in a ramp strike. If your approach is low, add power to decrease the rate of descent. As you approach optimum glide slope, reduce power to prevent the aircraft from climbing through the glide slope. Then follow through with an intermediate power correction to maintain the centered ball. In a low and slow condition, your primary concern is to fly the aircraft back to optimum glide slope. This requires a large power addition. When a positive rate of climb is achieved, the attitude of the aircraft is lowered to obtain optimum angle of attack. Approaching optimum glide slope, a rather large power reduction is necessary to prevent the aircraft from climbing through the glide slope or accelerating. An intermediate power addition is required to stabilize the aircraft on the glide slope and prevent another settle. The most obvious accident that can occur when settling below the glide slope is a liquid landing. If the pilot doesn't get as low as the water, he might still hit the ramp. More subtle problems arise on the secondary correction off the low. The pilot gets up to optimum glide slope, but fails to maintain it and settles to a low again. More often, the pilot climbs through the glide slope, flies over the top, and bolters. Corrections in close are very difficult. The primary complication is that as the aircraft gets closer to the deck, the space within the glide slope beam for making corrections gets smaller and smaller. The pilot is faced with getting over the ramp and not passing through the glide slope to a bolter. A related problem is the settle in the middle. This situation is especially common at night when depth perception is almost non-existent. This lack of depth perception can cause a mild case of vertigo, a feeling that the aircraft is too high. If the pilot looks only at the deck, the optimum glide slope appears to be too high at night. So he must be leave in the meatball and fight his urge to make the deck look right. The situation is extremely critical in approaches where the pilot breaks out at or close to minimums. When he breaks out, it's only natural for him to want to look at the deck. If he doesn't concentrate on the meatball, he will pull power off thinking he is high. At minimums, there is very little time for corrections. Pilots who get aboard regularly on the first pass at night are firm believers in the reliability of the meatball. An obvious concern in a carrier approach is lineup. It is important to establish lineup early in the approach. Late lineup corrections can cause glide slope problems. Remember, the ship is moving so your point of reference is constantly moving to your right. 
This point of reference is the intersection formed by the straight deck and the angled deck. For normal winds down the angled deck, pointing your nose toward this intersection will provide you with sufficient crab to keep lined up. Remember that a lineup correction reduces lift because of the bank angle and the increased drag caused by control deflection. Therefore, lineup corrections require additional power to prevent a settle below the glide slope or a decel. This should be followed by a reduction in power as wings are leveled to maintain the glide slope. One problem with late lineup is that the pilot usually does not observe meatball movement while looking at his lineup cues. That can be serious. Remember that a late lineup attempt may not guarantee proper lineup at touchdown. Airspeed control is primarily a function of aircraft attitude. There are many basic reasons why the aircraft must be on speed. These include the structural limits of the aircraft and the strength of the arresting gear. An aircraft that is too fast may exceed either or both of these limits. Also, the aircraft must maintain adequate airspeed for acceptable control. If it gets too slow, control is degraded past the point of safety. An extreme example is the stall, where the aircraft stops flying. Finally, proper hook-to-ramp clearance is predicated on the hook-to-eye value for an on-speed aircraft. If the airspeed is too fast, the aircraft has a flatter attitude than optimum, and the tail hook is actually higher than the meatball would lead the pilot to believe. On the other hand, in a slow or cocked-up attitude, the tail hook is lower. Now that we've explained how some accidents can happen, Let's look at a few results of improper procedures. prevent such accidents, today's carriers have many aids to bring you safely home. But the LSO is still a vital factor in your success. He brings to the operation human judgment based on extensive experience. From his position, he can see more clearly than the pilot when problems begin to develop in the approach. The LSO is in constant radio communication. With his pickle switch, he controls the wave off and cut lights. He has a hook to ramp indicator to keep him apprised of deck and glide slope conditions. 
He has a true airspeed readout on aircraft in the groove. There is a basic angle repeater that gives the glide slope angle. The roll angle indicator for proper hook to ramp clearance. Source, datum light, wave off and cut light brightness indicators and controls. And many others to assist both the pilot and the LSO. If the pilot is not set up safely on the glide slope, on speed, and lined up by the time he is in close, it is the LSO's responsibility to give him a wave off. Wave off. Any wave off is mandatory to prevent a possible accident. If this happens to you, go to full power and maintain optimum angle of attack. If you're slow, hold that angle of attack. Level your wings and climb straight ahead. The landing gear is not raised until you're sure you're past the deck. In flight engagement, or engaging the wire while the aircraft is in a climb, should never occur. But it has. In extreme situations, an LSO may wave off an aircraft at the ramp to ensure that the aircraft will clear the ramp. In this situation, an over-rotation on wave off could mean an in-flight engagement, usually with disastrous results. If you maintain optimum angle of attack, you won't be involved in an in-flight engagement. Remember, the meatball is not your only point of reference, but it is the key to a safe approach. The closer you get to the meatball, the more accurate its information. If you're lined up in the groove and maintaining proper glide slope and air speed, your corrections are minimized, and a successful landing is assured. Some pilots fly how they feel instead of relying on the ball. The meatball should be your main point of reference as you scan the entire landing situation. An experienced pilot knows he has to fight this urge to fly the deck. To the deck spotters, the deck looks high, so they settle. Next time it looks too low, and they may not catch the compensating climb in time. Sometimes they wind up on the ramp, or with a hard landing, or bolter. So keep your eye on the ball. Maintain lineup and angle of attack. Failure to observe these basic rules can be fatal. Anticipate those conditions where human failures lead to accidents and avoid them. Follow the procedures designed for your safety and the successful achievement of your mission. Know what you should do in all situations, and when the time comes, do it without hesitation.